Thank you, worship team. Thank you, New Life family, online and those that are here. Thank you for contributing to the presence in this place. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? It is great. Uh, my name's Trevor. I'm one of the leaders here. Uh, we're doing a series, a series called Fallen Angels, Architects of This Present Darkness. Quick disclaimer, there was a book written by Frank Peretti years ago. I've stolen that title from him, YouTube, uh, Facebook. I just want to let you know that I recognize this. Um, I, I think Frank would have no trouble with this. But, um, and uh, I'll be teaching for a couple of weeks. We thought we'd give our pastor a little break. Nothing to worry about. This is the second team, but you got to give the second team a chance every once in a while. You, you realize football fans, if you, you know, Tom Brady was second string behind Bledsoe for one or two years, and then eventually, eventually he did he did fine. And uh, there was some there was some concern that uh, uh, Stephen Kelly have a for sale sign out front. So there's been some worry that that meant he's leaving. But I've known Steve for 32 years. He is a Alexander County boy. I'll guarantee he's not going to South Sudan as, as much as he may want to. He will not be. He's, he'll be here in Alexander County, and in a few weeks he'll be back with you. But we're going to try to cover uh, this topic here. I appreciate also that the, um, the, the, the uh, intercessors have been praying for me because this is kind of a dark topic, and uh, I have been feeling the pressure of it, but it's been a few inches away. It hasn't been totally inside me, so I think I'm doing okay. The purpose of this series is to help us recognize that we humans are not exclusively responsible for all the evil out there. And that Satan, not Adam and Eve, initiated and brought evil into the world. Our personal evil thoughts and deeds are most often imposed and suggested to us by evil, and they don't actually originate within ourselves. So our challenge is not to condemn ourselves, to shame ourselves. The devil gets more, more mileage out of shame and condemnation than he does out of actual sin. Um, and that these things don't originate us. Our challenge is to resist and overcome temptation, not to be on a self-improvement campaign or something like that. Uh, also, sometimes we'll feel righteous anger towards evil and stuff around us, but it should be directed at evil spirits and not at other people. Our task is to love others, family, friends, even enemies, not hate or criticize them. And... If we're ever stuck in a situation for our self or loved ones where we're getting nowhere with our prayers, sometimes we can ask God to help to go after some of the evil around it too. That said, there's actually trained intercessors and deliverance people that attack this kind of head on. I don't recommend that unless you get some training or hang around with them. You know, there used to be a saying, you know, don't try this at home. In fact, I heard one time that there was a, a Superman cape that the kids could buy and there was a disclaimer on it saying, the use of this does not allow, does not Per, give the wearer the ability to fly. You know, it was on the thing. Just make sure they understood that. So similarly, uh, you, you got to be a little. This is somewhat dangerous territory. Now, I, I, there's a, I, on our new life site. This is newlifenc.com. New You'll see up there. There's a drop-down menu for media, and you can go to. Um, it's I can't quite read it, but it's servant notes, uh, servant notes, MP3s. And if you go there, you'll see that each week, we, above that, there's video. You can watch this again on video, one, one little click above that, or you could do an MP3 in your car, or my sermon notes will be available too. And the sermon notes will actually be way more extensive than what I cover, and I talk quite fast, so you may want to jot a few things down, but don't think you have to jot everything down. All this is available to you. This is almost a course, and, but anyway. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Satan, the accuser of the brethren, but in the weeks to come, God willing, this may even extend into the fall, we're going to take a look at what are referred to once in the Bible and in Second Temple literature as watchers and the Nephilim, which is the source of demons. The second is look at some of the fallen angels after the Tower of Babel, which are actually the source of the principality and powers that Paul talks about that rules things evilly in the world. We're going to look how evil false, uh, forces corrupt cultures how they have so effectively questioned the word of God that most of academia and outside of us, they don't even pay attention to it when it is the truth, it is the best stuff out there. And if you spend some time in it in your life like I have for 47 years, it's the richest thing in any direction you could look to. Uh, we're gonna take a look at how evil forces have challenged God's role in creation 
and by what I'll prove is mathematically unsustainable science, try to make a case against the creation. And then finally, how we can deal with some of these forces as a church. Now, supernatural evil created beings introduced evil into the Garden of Eden. They taught ancient man evil in the form of occult worship, magic, and unnatural sexuality. They encourage evil today. They make evil even more evil than normal evil, if there is such a thing. They, they promote unnatural evil, which don't even, humans don't even, shouldn't even, wouldn't even think to do if it wasn't for them. And they tempt us towards addiction to things of the world. Now, Satan is referred to in the Bible as the accuser of the brethren. Um, I talked a little bit about his fall last week, two weeks ago. Last, last week we had that wonderful time with the Bethany, Col Col Bethany College of Mercy. I taught before that. You can go look this up. And basically I made a case from two uh, passages of uh, the nature of Satan and how he fell. Now, a lot of this stuff I won't be able to completely develop. You may have to go to my notes. You may have to trust me a little bit. Now, most of what you've learned about this topic are, is steeped in Catholic and then early Reformation teaching. A lot of it's good. 90% of it. But crazily, in the 1800s, there was all these archaeological finds of all this incredible stuff we didn't know about before. That There was the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a discovery of what's called Second Temple Literature. And we actually have more data about what was going on around the time of Jesus than we ever have before. And the findings consistently establish more, more truth and reality of it. It's fun. Now, those things are not canon, so if I reference the book of Enoch, I'm not talking like the same as the book of Ezekiel, but it's a lot of information there that not all of it's wrong. There's some fascinating stuff that really helps us understand pretty much what was going on around the time of the Jesus of, of understanding these things, and some of these cryptic, strange passages, you'll see there's some good explanations for it that it's very, very likely that the people around the time of Jesus held that view. Now... Likely, Satan in the garden was not a physical snake like a boa constrictor, as often depicted, but a glorious, shining being, probably a cherub or a seraph, to whom Eve paid great deference and acknowledged him as one who seemed to possess temper, uh, superior knowledge and was of a superior order. I said before that Adam and Eve had it made. You know, perfect garden, God was there. Uh, they didn't even need clothes, which means they, they didn't even need the protection of clothes. Um, the best wife in the history of all time before the fall, the best husband in the history. My wife rolls her eyes, but this was like a Harlequin romance novel type thing, you know. And so it isn't something that you'd throw away in a second, you know. So it, she wasn't tricked by a dumb snake. This being was sharp. In, uh, in Ezekiel 28, he, Satan is called a cherub. Instead of him, he seals up the sum full of wisdom Perfect in beauty, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. And further, there's a line in it that says, you were in Eden and you fell. I won't develop that yet, but there's a most a teaching about Satan and the fall. There's only one fall, probably between Genesis 1, 1, 1 and 1, 2. But I'll make a case that there's been falls all along and that angels are still at risk of falling crazily. Here's two pictures. The one on the left, there's the snake version. And the one on the right, there's, they're talking to an angelic being. It's two slight problems with this. You know, seraphs and cherubim have more wings, and regular angels don't have any wings at all. But I don't want to argue the point. They're just, they just look like men. Okay, now there are later references truly to Satan as a serpent, but these could be figures of speech. Uh, uh, Herod is called a fox. Judah is called a lion's whelp. Jesus is the lamb of God, a metaphor. Interesting, remember the curse that is given by God to the serpent, to, the, to Satan after the, after the event of the fall. He says, on thy belly thou shalt go. Now, he probably wasn't on his belly before. He wasn't confirming what already was going on. He's saying, well, he used to be this glorious thing, but now you will be snake-like. You will be humiliated. And then he says, dust she shall eat is an indication of humiliation. So this is what would happen after the fall and did happen to him. Now, he is referred to as a dragon, and a dragon is a kind of a mean snake-like dude, you know. But the point is, he wasn't really a snake before, and he's a snake like now. He's a snake and a serpent and a dragon now as a result of the curse. So Satan in the garden was a very impressive-looking being and a very good wizard. I talked about the Wizard of Oz two weeks ago. That being, the, remember, the wizard, when he's confronted by... Uh, uh, Dorothy, who says, you're a bad person. He goes, no, I'm not a bad person. I'm just a bad wizard. And then, in other words, 
And he kind of was explaining that you can't have both. If you're a good person, you're probably not a good wizard. If you're a bad person, you're capable of being a serious good uh, wizard. Okay, but Satan initiated the rebellion against God, not Adam and Eve. This mess we're in started with Satan. Satan, much more than Adam and Eve, is the cause of the fall and our present darkness. Hence, he and other fallen angels doom. Humans are redeemable. Evil, these evil creatures are unredeemable. And now God's in the good God. I mean, God will work with you. You know what I'm saying? And the fact that these guys are unredeemable. In fact, in, one of, in the, Enoch 1, he goes, the watchers try to talk him into going to God to get them out of their predicament once they're in hell. And he tries and God says, no. Because that's how evil it was. So in summary, our off-maligned great, 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 great grandmother Eve was not tricked by a talking copperhead, but an impressive, smart, subtle, glorious looking, but evil angelic being. And so I'm a little bit more sympathetic to Eve and women after this. <laughs> now this, in, in the garden, it started what's, what the Bible calls the battle of the sea. And this is very interesting. The Bible, you know, if you've, I've read, I think the New Testament about 25 times, the Old Testament about eight times, nine times. And so each time you go through it, you can have a different emphasis. And one of the emphasis is the battle of the sea. That is, Satan is trying to make sure Jesus Christ was not born. And even today, the seed of the Holy Spirit in us, he's trying to make sure it's not effective. He's always trying to goof up the sea. And and so what God says to the servant says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, likely a big S, talking specifically about Christ, although she does have offspring, which would be believers. Uh, you shall bruise his head and he shall bruise your heel. The bruising of his head is the eventual crushing of Satan by the work of Christ. And the bruising of the heel is the crucifixion and all that he went through. Now God's plan after the fall was to bring the Messiah, the Christ, his son, into the world in the fullness of time, which ended up being about 2,000 years ago. To overcome the curse of the fall, to conquer sin, Satan and death, and to offer eternal life to those who believe. Good plan. The son was to be born of God and woman. So there was a genealogy of women that would carry the seed of the ancestors of Jesus all the way to Mary. Now, unfortunately, the Bible, and most of the time, is kind of patriarchic, and so most of the lineages are all men. They're all talking about men. But the woman is the woman is the important one because that's the one that ends up having to make sure D Mary's DNA had to be good. Mary could not have demon DNA. And Mary had to be in good shape, like, like Noah, perfect in her time. And the Catholics even go to so far the Immaculate Conception. That's another thing not necessary. But the point is, I'm going to make that Mary had good genes. Now, on the other side, you got Joseph, but really who you have is the Holy Spirit. And we know God has good genes. We're not worried about that. And so the side you worried about was the woman's side. And unfortunately, when you go through the genealogy, they mention Rahab, they mention Ruth, we know of, but they always ignore the ladies. But the fact is, and so they would be married to men listed in the Bible, and the men are usually whose name it is, but it's the woman who's carrying the seed. So from Adam to Seth, to Noah, to Shem, to Abraham, to David, to Solomon, there was good seed. Now Solomon, I mean, David had all about 30 kids or something, 10 wives or something. But anyway, there was Bathsheba, and Bathsheba, the first son of Bathsheba was Solomon, and the third was Nathan. And I'm going to show you that the lineages at the beginning of your New Testament, which you'll look at, one's in Matthew and one's in Luke, they're, they're, not, the same, they're not the same lines. And one of them, I think, I'm pretty sure, one of them is going to uh, um, Joseph, uh, which ends up being to God, kind of, you know, but one of them is going to Mary. Okay, now, anyways, uh, let me show you this. The genealogies of Matthew to Joseph and Luke likely to Mary to Jesus. Matthew follows the line of David's son Solomon and the rulers of Judah, whereas Luke follows the line of Nathan III, both by Bathsheba, but two different lines. Now, Matthew's genealogy includes the line of all of Judah's famous kings. You've heard of many of them, Rehoboam, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, Josiah, and the royal line. At the, it says in Matthew, it says, David begot, blah, 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 go down to the end, but Josiah... Um, and then it continues all the way down, eventually where it says, jo Japheth begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus, of whom J 
Jesus, who is called the Christ, was born. Now, why is this important? The reason is, uh, Matthew's writing to the Jewish people. Luke is writing more to Gentiles. It's to a guy named Theophilus. He's writing to the Greeks. To the Jews, it's really important that Jesus has to be in the line of Judah. Now, they, the nation rejected him first time. They're going to get an opportunity and will receive him the next time, but it would be even harder for them if this didn't work. I mean, they knew that this had to be the throne of David, Jesus, and that is the line through, through which the genealogy is from Matthew. Uh, there it says that. Okay. Now, Luke's lineage is, goes, starts with Nathan, the third son of David in Bathsheba, does not include the Judah kings. Uh, it ends up, it starts from Jesus and goes backward, and it has the strange line saying, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. Now, the reason it says that is because he, Joseph isn't really the dad. He's like the stepdad. Kind of. God and the Holy Spirit is the father. And so basically, it, there's two theories. One is that the, the line from Nathan is to Mary, or the other is that Joseph had two parents. But I think the Mary explanation is a little bit better. Now, the reason I, I'm saying all this for a reason. Don't, let me not lose you yet. That is, Jesus is from the Lion of Judah, from the, uh, the tribe of Judah on both sides of his family. And this seed was protected seed that wasn't contaminated by, by satanic DNA all the way to the birth of the Christ. Okay, now, so that is the seed. The big S seed is Jesus, and the seed was the lineage perfectly all the way from Adam to Mary. Now, what is Satan's seed? In 1 John 3, the, the Bible says, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So there's children of the devil, which we are not, we hope. And the field, in Matthew, in the parable of the sower, it says, for the field is the world. As for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one that are sown. So there's good and bad seed. Now, that is in a spiritual way. In addition, there may be a literal satanic seed, and that is, and next week I'm going to get into this at length, which is the story in Genesis 6 where it says the sons of God came down with the daughters of women and they produced giants. And so it could well be that there's somehow satanic seed was in human beings for a while and before and after the flood actually. And so that the relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of man would contaminate the DNA and the line from Eve in a satanic attempt to corrupt Mary's offspring that the Christ could not be born. Sounds crazy, but this is quite possible. Make it for her for impossible for the spotless Lamb of God to be born through Mary. Now, when the Nephilim ploy of Satan has failed because of the flood, and then subsequently because the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Israelites eventually destroyed all the Nephilim, in, as far as we can tell, in Canaan, um, what has, he, Satan had to change his strategy. And instead of using contamination of the seed, he started to war against the seed. And the warring is trying to kill off all the ancestors of Jesus so not one can exist. And of course, remember the story of Moses. What did Pharaoh do? He was trying to kill all the firstborn of the Jews. The midwives were supposed to let all the baby boys die. But the midwives did not. Uh, there's a great story of King Joash who was, uh, there was this evil queen, Athaliah, who's, uh, he, she tried to kill everybody left in the line, and a priest, Jeho Jehoiada, I think you pronounced it, hid this little baby, in, and the little baby grew up in the temple, hidden, and eventually when he turned six, he became king, and they killed the evil queen. So it came that close, one person from it, it all dying out. Uh, other Jewish kings were killed in battle. Jesus, as a baby, remember Herod tried to kill everybody under age three? Tried to kill Jesus before he could fill it. There was a time when there was a mob and they tried to throw him off the cliff. He's in, in a boat that storms come. It's like every devil's trying his hardest to make sure that Jesus does not make it to the cross. And he fails. And I'll tell you, if there's any reason I will bless Israel and the Jewish people is, you know, unfortunately, you read the Old Testament, you can get a bad taste in your mouth a little bit. You know, they had a rough time. They weren't that faithful. But they got Jesus into the world and they protected him. And God and them pulled that off, and they will be blessed. God considers them his people, will bless them, and they'll be best blessed in the future too because somehow this survived in an incredible satanic attack against, against genes and against human beings. Interesting? Yeah, I think so. Okay, 
Now, there's a satanic hierarchy. That is, we think of the devil, and I think before my talks, you're going to think they're all the same. They're just one's meaner than the other. They're all a bunch of fallen angels, but probably not. In Ephesians 6, 12, it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, this present darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So in addition to Satan, there are evil principalities, which are people of the been not people, evil beings that have been assigned over regions, like the United States, like different places. Not as bad here as all other places, but there's an assignment. There's watchers, which were actually this group of, of angels that fell in Genesis 6 and had relationships with women, and most, if not all of them, are actually in a special place of hell right now. Then there's your rank and file demons. And these, uh, these entities are actually a little bit different, and even of different makeup, as I'll show you. Now, Satan is a created being like us, and unlike God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Satan is stuck in time and place, cannot see into the future. He only makes it look like he can by self-fulfilling prophecy. So all the stuff about astrology and all that stuff, absolute nonsense. It doesn't work at all. If it works, it's because you get scared into thinking you're going to be in a car wreck or something, and you're so nervous when you're driving to you get a car wreck, honestly. It's like, it's complete nonsense. And if you want me to prove it to you, it's based on where the sun is in certain constellations. Well, the thing started like, what, 4,000 years ago? And the sun has moved, so it's in the, the next constellation. So if you're a Taurus, you think you're a Taurus, you're really an Aries. It's a month off. I don't want to get farther, but not only does it not work, you know, you're in the wrong, you're, you're guessing your wrong month right now, and nobody changed the rules after 4,000 years. And the one thing I want to emphasize about anything else is the reason it's good that we're worshiping God is he's the creator. Everything else we're going to talk about in every direction, the most powerful human being, the worst devil, the worst demon, they're all, they've been made and we're serving the creator. And the Jewish people and us were not allowed an intermediary except for Jesus Christ who's a co-creator and part of the Trinity. You can't worship Angel Michael on the way to Jesus. It's the same thing as the, the demon worshipers are doing. We get firsthand God him himself through his son and through the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful thing. And it's, he's in a different class than all these guys. It's not even close. I'll get into this some real fun. The, the Jewish scholars have some real fun with that in mocking. Alan's teaching you about Elijah. There are a lot of places where they absolutely mock all these, these demons and stuff that we're supposed to be so afraid of. Uh, some characteristics of Satan. He's a thief. Uh, the Savior says in John 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. The goal of Jesus in your life and the life of every person on earth is to bring them fulfillment and blessing. The goal of Satan is to goof them off. Right. And, uh, um, you know, it's like, I am even positive that the most wicked person that's ever existed, God is trying to figure out a way that he will be in the least deep spot in hell. I hate to say it, but it's like he's always trying to figure out a way to be beneficial. I think untimely deaths are sometimes, because God knew how bad things were going to get and to minimize the damage, pull the person out. Um, and so he's always working for the good. He's who you need to follow, not these other rascals that are just out for your bad. He's a deceiver. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this because Alan is spending weeks and weeks on deception. The thing about deception is if, you're, if we are in deep deception, you can't, it is impossible for a person to get themselves out of their own deception. It has to take an internal help. If you're lucky, if you're in some embarrassing deception, if you're lucky, the Holy Spirit will get a hold of you and you'll repent. And it's just between you and him and not the whole country on the internet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, but it takes somebody else. And often it's somebody you don't want to hear it from, actually, be it a spouse or something, that eventually points out, because if you're stuck in the deception, you're stuck. That's the whole nature of it. And so he's a deceiver. In Revelations, this is about the future, but he does it all the time. When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from prison, will go out to deceive the nations who are in the four corners of the world. His job is deception. He's a slander and a liar. He, he, you know the idea of diabolo or a diabolic? That is, the Greek is diabolo, the English is devil. So diabolo, and what diabolo, diabolos, is a slanderer, or it means slandering. It's so basically it's saying he is, is, the word the devil means the slanderer. 
in John 8, it says, he, Jesus says, the devil was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks the native language. I don't know that version, but it's good. He speaks the native language because he's a liar and the father of lies. Now, my little experience in uh, deliverance is that I try to talk to the person who's being delivered. And it's like you can almost count on the devil blind. It's like this is nature. It's like you can mix lies and truth. Alan teaches on that. But in general, you can always count on it being wrong whatever you're being told. It's wrong. It's the opposite of right. And in your deception, you don't see it. But if they see it, they realize all these things that are speaking to them, of course they're not right. They're lies. They're not correct. It's the nature of it. Satan is an accuser. Now, this is interesting. This will burst a little bubble there. Don't throw tomatoes yet, but... Uh, in the, the Hebrew is has Satan or Satan, which means the accuser. Now, in the Old Testament, there is 26 references to Satan, and everyone but one has an article in front of it, meaning a Satan or the Satan. And the reason that's important is Hebrew, just like uh, English, if we were to say Bill with a capital B, it maybe is the name of one of your people here, but if we were to say, so we say Bill came to church today, we understand that. But if it said a, bi a bill came in the mail, there's a whole different meaning because it's, and so a Satan and all, even in the Job story, there's an accuser, probably the devil. I mean, you gotta look at the context. But there's an accuser that God has allowed to be involved and it may or may not be Satan. It's only in the story where David numbers uh, the Israel and then Satan appears to him. That's the only time it is a, a name. So in general, it's meaning an accuser allowed by God to be involved in this. For the accuser of the brethren, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down, Revelations, future. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Now, our accuser, day and night, Satan pours out a stream of accusations into our minds, a ceaseless running commentary on your life. It's like if you ever watch sports, you know, these guys are playing their hearts out and these guys are making all these complaints and comments about how they should have been doing it right and everything. You know, and so, but that's what's happening. That's what the devil's doing to you. It's like, you're doing the best you can. And he's, no, you're doing wrong. You got it wrong. It's like a, a running commentary in your head, if you allow it, to accuse you. You are a sinner. You will never overcome your addiction. Your situation is hopeless. You're out of God's will. You are weak, ineffective, incapable. God can't love you. You are unforgiven for your past sins. Is it just me or does sometimes these thoughts come up? I have a quote from, there was a lady I enjoy reading from the, her name is Jessie Penn Lewis. Some, it's kind of controversial, but I get a kick out of a lot of her writings. She was a person who worked with uh, Evan Roberts in the Great Welsh Revival. And here's what, I, this has been with me my whole life and has helped me when I'm under great condemnation. She writes about our minds. She says, you have not been conscious of this stream of persistent accusations which you thought was all from yourself. Not having recognized the source of it, you have let it turn in upon yourself until friends have called you morbid or nervous or giving way, while others say again it's your character. You can do nothing happily because all of this stream of self-accusation, as you call it. You do not know how to pray. You are not fit to be a worker. You are not this and that and the other. It crushes you and takes the smile from your face. All this time, it is a stream from the enemy as the accuser is pouring into your mind a flood of accusations about yourself, which, if you would only recognize they, could, they came from him, could cease. Now, this is important, kind of important, in which case the challenge is not, Trevor, be a nicer person. What's wrong with you? How do I resist this and, not, and ask God's help to keep this out of me and keep this off me? If we listen to the accusations, we become self-condemned, depressed, anxious, unable to work, play, unable to minister to others, doubters of the goodness of God. Amen. In Proverbs 15, by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. I was a physician for 40 years, and in the, in the incredible craziness of science, it's almost like they believe that depression is caused by neurotransmitter problems. Now, the reason this is crazy, so it's like you could live a godly, kind life, good parents, good upbringing, and all of a sudden at age 17, bang, your neurotransmitters go wrong and you're a serial killer. Yeah. Like, if anybody thinks, is that, this is the craziest thing you ever heard of? 
Now, neurotransmitters are things in your brain that if you have been stressed out, if you've gone through stuff, they do change. But the cause is not the neurotransmitter, it's the result. There's a condition called carpal tunnel where you use your hands too much and eventually the nerves don't work to your hands. Well, it's not like your nerves went bad, it's the circumstance of the life that contributed and then the nerves went bad. So you gotta get the order of this. And the reason this is important, it is important what we think. It is important what we let inside us to try to work towards good mental health. So we become, if, they, if we let this stuff into us, we become self-centered, self-absorbed, excessively introspective, that's me. No time for others. We're ineffective, unsuccessful in life in Christian service. We consistently fall to the same sins. This is a lot more the devil's fault than it's yours, but you get, we gotta resist. We may even take on the nature of the evil spirit that's tormenting us. Not just angry occasionally, but becoming an angry person. Have you known angry people? Not just negative occasionally, but woefully unhappy. Have you known people like that? Not fearful occasionally, but a nervous wreck. And that's because these spirits that want to occupy bodies are either occupying you or they're close enough that they're trying to turn you into what they are or want to be. The apostle talks about footholds and strongholds developing. Addictions are always demonically mediated and controlled. It's one thing to, like I've joked, eat a third piece of pie occasionally, but if you gotta eat the third piece every time, there's devils involved. (laughs) And that's why why not devil's food cake? I mean, that's where (laughs) it comes from. Okay, 2 Corinthians, um, the apostle writes, for though we we live in the flesh, We do not wage war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not the weapons of the world. Instead, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. These strongholds are stuff that really gets stuck in people that need to be driven out or helped out or repented out of. Footholds, I don't have the verse, but that's also, that's where the the devil has, has got a foot in the door for our sins. Now, in wonderful contrast, Jesus is our advocate. It says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Advocates, we know, like our lawyer and our propitiation. That is, because of our sin, we kind of owe God something. A payment is owed, and Jesus pays the payment. I've said it a bunch of times, but it's like if you're a teenager and you get caught speeding or you wreck the car and you're in front of a judge and you're say, the, the judge says, okay, you're either going to jail or you're paying some money and all of a sudden your dad or friend steps up and will pay it for you, you have the choice. You either allow him to pay it for you or you go to jail yourself. And so the world is either allowing Jesus to pay for our sins or they're going to jail or hell themselves. And if, like many of us or all of us here, if we have been willing to accept this payment, then our response, like your response to your father, is gratitude. It's praise and gratitude, right? It's, Thank you, Dad. And then further, we don't have to keep worrying about it after the penalty's paid. We don't have to spend the rest of our life, man, I think I'm still going to jail. No, the price was paid. So, now, so there's really a courtroom drama going on in third heaven where we are accused and then advocated by by Jesus. Now, this is a tough one, and there's people that are way better at me than this that I'll, I could refer you to, as a matter of fact. But that said, um, and there's verses, you know, there's a couple, there's a verse in the Bible where it says Satan is thrown out of heaven. Now, the context there is revelation right before the tribulation. There's another place where Jesus is really happy that his disciples are casting out devils, and he, he kind of laughs, I saw Satan fall from heaven. Now, that, I, I think there he's talking in terms of authority and not metaphorical, but more authority. That is, usually Satan's on the throne around here, but he just got kicked out of his place by you dudes because you're casting his devils out. Point being, when you look at the Job story, what happens is, you know, uh, Satan or a Satan comes up and God and asks for me, he comes up to God and God says, where you been? He says, I'm wandering around the world, third heaven, but he comes up for, to, to talk to, to God. And so God and him talk a little bit about Job, what's gonna happen with Job. And so it looks like the Satan does have access when allowed to heaven, has access, and there he could be an accuser against us. And so further, we give him, if we sin, we give him a little bit of access that we're allowed to be accused. Okay, what are the weapons of our spiritual war? So anyway, so there's a battle going on in which I sin, 
uh, the devil says, look at that. You know, what the heck? And then Jesus advocates for me saying, well, yeah, he's, yeah, that's a problem. But Jesus has paid for his sins. You know, I'm working with him, the Holy Spirit. He's going to do better, et cetera, et cetera. So he stands up for me, so to speak, in this setting. Now, what are the weapons of our spiritual warfare? Uh, the weapons of Ephesians 6, I think Steve may get into that sometime in the future, but you know the list. There's the word, the truth, faith, righteous living, personal peace and salvation. This is the good love of our enemies, trying not to despise those around us. Forgiveness, a big weapon. Persuasion of others in the spirit of Christ that were on the offensive. Intercession and deliverance. These are the, these are the weapons of our warfare that we can use to keep our minds in good shape and help others. Now, our struggle against personal sin is won by obeying God consistently, by doing good, resisting demonic temptations, and reckoning ourselves dead to sin. Now, the serious man in history, the George Mueller's, the different people you read about, those guys believed they were dead to sin. I wish I could be one of them. You know what I mean? I mean, they woke up and they didn't think, man, I hope I make it to this day. You know, they thought, I am dead to sin. That, that, that's like, and I think the only way you can explain it, if you could think of any sin that's out there that disgusts the, the brains out of you that you would have nothing to do with, you're dead to that sin. And so these guys just wanted to be dead to every sin, even uh, uh, in the mid 90s, God zapped the daylights out of me and I was on fire for God. I cried all the time. I like, I, I mean, I just, I was a doctor and I'd witnessed all my patients. My nurse was mad at me because they'd be all waiting until nine, seven o'clock, nine o'clock at night. I was just a, I was a God wreck. And I swear to you, I went days without sinning. And it wasn't because I was a good person, but I saw how bad sin was. Sin was every sin pride, lust, anything was as disgusting as my most disgusting sin. And I thought I would never sin again. And we can be there, and that's, what it, that's the starting point of reckoning yourselves dead to sin. Then after that, when you have a little trouble, that's when you, you, know, you repent and do stuff. So James says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is the Romans verse. It says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life, for you have, he who has died has been freed from sin. Otherwise, likewise, you should reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God. And so I try this. We can try it every morning. You know, when I get up, I have a quiet time. And I try to reckon myself as dead to sin, and of course, the devil throws everything but the kitchen sink at me through the day, and there's days I do better than others, but you gotta start from that place. I mean, if you don't start from that place, 10 minutes into it, you're already toast. So that's the advantage of a little quiet time where you're in the word, you're praying to God, you gotta take a couple deep breaths and get started, and then try to fight the battle through the rest of the day. Now, our victory is maintained by wrestling and it talks in Ephesians about the whole armor of God that we could stand against the wiles of the devil. This will be elaborate. Now, the accusations of the demonic are in the air. I love this. What is air? Well, the air is second heaven. That is, I don't understand this completely, but see, the, de the devil and all those guys are not in the middle of the earth somewhere, not around us. They're like around. Just like God has a throne somewhere, but the Holy Spirit is around. They're just like as close as you could possibly be in another dimension. And so to, the way that the, the writers describe it is like the air around you. It's like the devils are that close and the Holy Spirit's that close. It says, um, and uh, they can enter our souls and our thoughts from being that close if you let it in. But if, if your mind is full of the Holy Spirit and your spirit obeying, that's what's inside the cranium. But if you let the other stuff in, then it's bad stuff in it. It says, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience or works in us if we're in disobedience. Uh, this is another great verse. That we should no longer be children tossed and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, the winds in the air. By the trickery of men, the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, and this, of course, is heresies, new fads, rumors, conspiracies, deceptions. And if there's ever a time when we were prone to be cast about by the wind, it's right now, because, you know, I said, it used to be, if you were a pioneer in the United States, what would you do? You had a farm way out somewhere, and you and your kids worked 
18 hours a day, read the Bible, went to bed, and once a month you went to town where you'd see other human beings. Now, it'd be e kind of easy not to sin in that setting, wouldn't it? I mean, really. But right now, you know, in every direction, every media, whatever, it's just crazy easy to sin. And that is wind of doctrine. That's how bad it is. Okay. Luke says, the sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed it, some fell by the wayside but the, and was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured. So birds in the Bible are bad. You ever see the movie Birds by Hitchcock? I mean, <laughs> every once in a while I worry, you know, I'm working outside, and all the birds start clucking around. I'm like, is this the day, you know, where they're going to figure out that they could peck me to death? Um, but so birds in general are considered bad, and they, because in the parable of the sower, the, the seed is thrown, which is the word of God that could go in someone's heart and result in fruit, but the birds pick it up first. This is a good picture here. I thought of Alan Smith when I saw this because, uh, you know, look at the ground, how rough it is. It's rocks and there's birds all over. Like, this is a farmer's bad day. And it's, you know, it's like, no, you're the farmer. But Alan has taught us, you know, what you got to do is you got to plow. You got to get the rocks out of there and plow, which is the metaphor of a hard heart versus a soft heart. The limitations of the accuser, the demonic spirits only have as much access to our souls as we allowed. Same, unfortunately, is true of God, but we want to allow God more. First uh, Corinthians, no temptation has seized you except which is common to man. So if you're having a really bad day, don't pour me it. Everybody's going through this. God is faithful. He will not let you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand under it. For me, it's out loud calling on God is what it is sometimes. I mean, goofily, you gotta say it out loud even if I'm about to really be in trouble. Now, Satan needs God's permission to work on us. Remember the story where Jesus is talking to Simon before he betrays him and says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed to you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Amen. I mean, know the Job, Job narrative all about the permission. Now, God actually uses Satan for his purpose. In Judges, it says, God sent an evil spirit a whole other teaching on how that would be possible from God. Uh, between Abimelech and caused all this trouble. Abimelech was in trouble, and so this evil spirit got to where Abimelech gets killed because that's what God wanted. And then uh, in Luke 22, it says, And Satan entered Judas, uh, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and discussed with them how he might portray Jesus. God allows Satan to tempt us and accuse us to strengthen our faith, to give us something to overcome so we're not bored, expose our flesh's weakness and humble our pride. The apostle, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the, these surpassingly great revelations, prophets watch out, uh, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Okay, I'm gonna end with this. I've used this many times, but I just love it too much. And so for those for you, it's new. Otherwise, sometimes it's good to go over it. In Pilgrim's Progress, it's the story of this fella who is in the city of the Vanity Fair. He's a sinner, and the evangelist talks to him, and he gets a burden on his back. That burden is a burden of sin. He realizes he's a sinner. And so then he realizes that when he gets saved, the burden falls off. I actually was in England one time, and I went to the place where the Methodism started, this foundry, and I wandered around in, in a uh, uh, cemetery across the way. I'd, I came at the wrong time. I was just killing time, and, and uh, John Bunyan was buried there. And they showed this tomb and everything. It was really fun. But anyway, and so, so then Pilgrim figures it out and he goes through his life and he goes through the valley of despair and all this. It's a metaphor of what we go through. Well, finally near the end, he meets this demon called Apollyon, which is definitely the devil. And in his exchange, the devil says, where are you going? I thought you used to be in my group. And, and Christian says, no, I left. I joined another group. And so here's how the conversation goes. Apollyon looked upon Christian with eyes hooded with pride. No prince worthy of his title releases his subjects easily, and I am no different. I am not ready to let you loose as yet, but since you have complained about your service and wages, once you realize how good it was to be with God instead of under the devil, it says, let me encourage you to go back home. I personally promise that what our country can afford, I will give to you. But Christian shook his head. I cannot do that, you see. I've already yielded myself to another, even to the king of princes, how can I, in all fairness, go back with you? Then Apollyon broke out in a furious rage, saying, I am an enemy to this king. I hate his person, his laws, his people. I have come out on purpose to destroy you. But Christian replied, Apollyon, beware of what you do. I am on the king's highway, the way of holiness, 
Therefore, take heed. And when we start to see some of this, you realize that we are the aggressor. We are the dangerous one. And the highway of holiness, I got a teaching on that, is just this, this starting the day, being, wrecking yourself dead, trying to walk with God, dealing with any sin or problem comes up, staying in the spirit. And in that, you are a dangerous person. And when you're there, you will tend to talk to others about Jesus. You'll tend to minister and pray for people. You'll tend to be, it, and it's almost like you don't even have, and if you're there, you don't even have to worry about all the evil. Because you are, you, it's like, you, it's like a, a, a batter who's not worried about the, the fielders out there. You know how to hit, you know what to do, and, and that's how it is. And so anyway, so, and, and really, you know, even though this topic seems kind of weird, what I'm hoping for is this, that we realize how much we have the upper hand and how much with the Creator God we can proceed. Amen. So how many, uh, I think I did all that. All right. Yes. And here is uh, St. Michael throwing uh, Satan out of heaven. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this word. Uh, Karen, you can come on up. And we pray, Lord God, that we truly could like uh, your disciples, like the men in history of old, the women in history of old, we could be able to walk in a way that's glorifying to you, that brings your kingdom in a way that's a blessing to those around us, that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, we, uh, we're gonna do a song now, just like before, you know, if the Lord really spoke anything to you, if there's someone you want to pray for to be released from the stuff they're into, if you want to, you know, this teaching was not really to get you all to repent. If there's anything to repent of, is repent of blaming yourself for a lot of this stuff when the fact is you have enemies that are out there causing trouble. So any repentance would be the realization, the shift in thinking to how I can walk this out more effectively knowing how much God's with me and how much potential I have. So if there's anything along the lines in your seat or whatever, you can come up front. And then uh, after that, Alan will dismiss us. We have opportunity today for baptism. If you haven't been baptized or would you like to do kind of renewal in the baptismal waters, we'll have opportunity for people to pray for you. So hang around a few more minutes, those who want to. Thank you, Trevor. That was just incredible. was fallen man, maybe not a fallen angel, but we've been created by Christ Jesus. Um, Pastor Clifton, if you would come up, uh, please. This is a dear friend of mine of the Cherokee Nation. If you're in, here in the first service, he prayed for us, and uh, I felt like the Lord wanted him to. Uh, a lot of you have never been blessed in Cherokee tongue. Uh, and I'm going to ask him to dismiss us in prayer and to speak a, a blessing over us. And uh, uh, that's all I'll say. But he carries a lot in his, he carries a lot. So just receive. Okay, I will pray, pray in my language and then I'll come back in English as much as I can. Ecoe, <laughs> Nusta, Kanikesha, Nigahia Neha, Gothish Tiladikesha, Oneste Ulsi Goya, Squanesha Nako he eco, A wohiyu, Kanikesha, Nitakahia Nail, Nusta, Kanikesha, Nigahia Nete, Chatuliska. Father, I thank you for this gathering here this day. And as we do come together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father, I believe darkness is real. 
Father, and I pray that light will begin to shine upon darkness. Father, I pray that ignorance, which represents darkness, Father, you created that from the beginning. I pray now that the light will begin to shine. And when the light, Heavenly Father, begins to shine, I pray, Heavenly Father, that your wisdom will now be given unto your people here in this region. Father, and I pray that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us be spiritually awakened by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let that door begin to be open right now, Heavenly Father, where we need no man to teach us. But now we have the Holy Ghost inside of each and every one of us to reveal so that we can manifest the Christ nature inside of each and every one of us. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. My brother will be with us on the Smith and Rowland show this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Jason said he was going to share it to the New Life Facebook, if that's okay. Uh, so it'll be somewhere around 3 o'clock if you'd like to. I have no idea what we're going to get into. I have the, absolutely no idea, but I'm anticipating great things. So Lord Jesus, go with us. We receive this blessing. That this is a blessed people of God that's here today. And those that are watching online, and I bless everyone, oh God, in mental and physical and spiritual blessings this week. That we might leave and go from here in the power of the Holy Ghost. That we might leave from here and do the work of the ministry. That we might affect this earth in which you placed us in, in this strategic time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You can come up for prayer, baptism, see Michael, prayer pods, or the altar. Thank you.